thank you for uh, for coming tonight. Uh, I'd like to take credit for uh, the first day of, of true rain in how many uh, weeks or months, so uh, we should have scheduled our program uh, earlier, I guess. Again, I'm Joe Calabarusi, Executive Director of President Ford's Foundation. It's, it's nice to be here, nice to see a turnout in a, on a summer night. This program would not be possible if it wasn't for the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum Foundation and our wonderful relationship with Barnum Law. Representing Barnum tonight is Bruce Goodman. He, Bruce is a partner there in charge of the energy group. He will have the honor of introducing our distinguished speaker tonight. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce to get to the program. Oh, it's so nice to see people braving the uh, the rain, and uh, thanks for coming. A lot of familiar faces out there. Um, welcome to the Gerald R. Ford Energy Lecture Series. This is the third lecture in the series that's been here in Grand Rapids. We had one over in Ann Arbor uh, back in April. That was uh, well received there as well. Um, let me just take a minute to explain how this lecture series evolved. Um, I was talking one day about two years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, to a colleague about the fact that the nation really didn't have an energy policy, hadn't had an energy policy for some time. And he reminded me, and I hate to say I do remember, uh, he reminded me of uh, the fact that President Ford did have an energy policy. He came to office and had some really um, specific ideas on what this nation should be doing in the way of energy conservation, uh, energy usage, yes, energy tax, and uh, he had an energy policy. And some of the uh, policies that he was able to put into effect have persisted to this day, uh, resulting in some of the alternative energy efforts uh, that uh, we all read about in the paper, solar, uh, wind, bioenergy, they got their start back in uh, President Ford's administration. So this gentleman said, you know, we really ought to have a lecture series right now when we need an energy policy, uh, and we ought to uh, honor uh, Gerald R. Ford. Uh, I contacted Joe. Joe thought it was a great idea, and as I say, this is the third uh, lecture that we've had, and uh, I don't know how many we're going to have, but every time somebody interesting comes along, we're going to try to put him or her in front of you. Um, tonight we have a, a, a military person who I will introduce in, in just a few minutes, a former uh, Lieutenant General, or still Lieutenant General Richard Zelmer, but I want to just give you an idea for the program for tonight. Uh, we're going to have the talk will last until about 8.10 or 8.15, uh, maybe not even that long. Um, short uh, remarks to kind of stimulate your thinking and then go through the Q&A for a half an hour, get all of you out of here by 8.45. Uh, but as uh, the general explained to me as we were just walking through the door, he said he really loves the Q&A portion of uh, this process because it allows him to learn and to hear what people are thinking about energy issues so that when he goes back to his group he has some new input for them. Uh, before we get started though I would like to introduce um, a special guest tonight. We have uh, Congressman Vern Ehlers here. Uh, who served as Michigan's third uh, district as congressman for more than 17 years. Um, he was, during his tenure, he was recognized as one of the smartest people uh, in Congress, um, one of the few scientists that have ever uh, risen to, to become a congressman. Um, the congressman and I were talking a few minutes ago about how one of the things that he did for President Ford when he was a congressman was put together a science advisory committee of science minds back here in his district who would advise him from time to time. So I'd like to invite Congressman Ehlers up for a minute 
to uh, address you and, and all, and uh, then I'll get to introducing our speaker. Congressman Ehlers. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm here to give the shortest speech of the evening, so, so you can relax. But I have spent a lot of um, my lifetime worrying about energy and energy issues. I am absolutely delighted to have someone here from the Department of Energy and the, the, the military arm of our federal government as well, because <clears throat> if we have another war, and I hope we don't have one for a long time, if we do, it's likely to be about energy, because that is how important energy has become in the lifeblood of our country and other countries. And uh, you'll probably hear a little bit more about this in the speech, although I haven't asked the speaker what he's going to talk about, but I'm sure he'll say it better than I could. But it is a, a, a major problem across the world of where are we going to get our energy in the future? And we just think of, well, natural gas, or go to a gas station, and so forth. That's all a limited supply. And what we have to be worrying about in the political arena and in the governmental arena is where, where are we going to go to get our energy in the future? And many people don't realize how important energy is and how our lives depend on it. And I find, uh, you know, I've taught in colleges and universities across the country, and I find most people just have no idea what energy is and why it's important. But energy is, put very simply, represents the ability to do work. And that's the reason we live the lives of luxury we do today. Because a hundred years ago, they didn't have energy resources the way we do today. And so always keep that in mind. The future of our nation, the future of our people, depends on ability to find, develop, and use copious amounts of energy without waste. And that's, that last phrase is the important one because we waste far too much energy today and we have to get used to using less and making do with what we have. So, I spoke longer than I intended to, but I didn't intend to speak at all. So, <laughs> so, so the moral of the story is never ask a congressman if he'd like to, <laughs> if he'd like to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I, I don't watch TV too much, but I have been watching the Olympics and I'm now definitely going to watch Monday nights, the new show on Revolution, because I don't know how many people have seen the previews on that, but the premise is all of a sudden energy goes out of our society. All the lights go off, all the cars stop running, and there's a revolution. Uh, it looks like an intriguing program, an intriguing premise, uh, which may make all of us think a little bit about uh, what energy does mean to us. Thank you, Congressman. Um, tonight's lecture, Lieutenant General Richard Zelmer, uh, you have notes in your program that, that are going to be far more ex extensive than what I'm going to say, but let me just give a short introduction. Um, General Zilmer uh, joined the United States Marine Corps shortly after graduating from Kutztown, or is it Cutstown? Kutztown. I still pronounced it wrong, State College in Eastern Pennsylvania. He was in the military for 36 years. He uh, commanded in Okinawa, and he commanded multinational uh, national forces in Iraq, in Anbar Province during 2006, 2007. Let me deviate from my notes here. I, when I was reading about him, uh, what caught my attention was that he wrote a memo uh, during his stint in Iraq uh, to his uh, higher-ups saying, you know, energy is a real problem in this war. 
and we really ought to be thinking about alternative energy in terms of solar, wind energy to pr produce electricity, and also biofuels because we're losing a lot of men and women transporting fuels, and I'm sure he'll touch on that, but it really, uh, it really struck me that perhaps as many as 10% of our casualties in these wars are because of all the fuels that need to be transported. Um, anyway, most recently, uh, the general has served as Deputy uh, Commandant of Manpower and Reserve Affairs, where he oversaw the placement of more than 200,000 active duty Marines and address manpower shortages in the selected Marine Corps Reserve. Since retirement, the general has served as a member of the CNA Military Board, a panel of high-ranking retired admirals and generals who study pressing issues to assess their impact on national security. Tonight, uh, he's going to be talking in part about the findings in the latest report of that group entitled uh, Ensuring America's Freedom of Movement, a National Security Imperative to Reduce U.S. Oil Dependence. And in his address tonight, he is going to draw on his experience in Iraq, overseas, and at military bases here in the U.S. Uh, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant uh, General Richard Zelmer to the Gerald Ford Energy Lecture Series. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, you'll forgive me if I still shout through the microphone. Uh, sometimes uh, old habits are hard, hard to uh, hard to break. Uh, before I begin, uh, I just want to make uh, a couple remarks, and that are uh, I have, uh, didn't know what to expect coming up here, and uh, you'd be surprised to know that 2,000 people <laughs> don't uh, look like the, the audience that's here. We were, I was told about two weeks ago that we probably have about 2,000 people here tonight, which I can assure you is a very intimidating uh, prospect. And uh, I've had formations, mandatory formations of a lot of Marines that have num never numbered 2,000. Uh, so I was a little bit relieved when the numbers came down a little bit. Uh, and as we spoke earlier, uh, I do want some credit for helping bring the rain here to, uh, to Michigan. Uh, and I'm hoping it's raining in Pennsylvania right now because we need it just as badly as, as you need it up here. Uh, let me thank you first for being here. And uh, in the course of my next couple minutes of remarks, uh, I'm guessing there's not a whole lot that I'm going to tell you that you don't already know or don't already suspect or don't already believe in your heart of hearts about the issues uh, that Bruce and Congressman Ehlers just uh, raised. Uh, we have some very, very serious choices about where our nation goes with respect to energy in the next 10 to 15 years. And I'll talk about some of my experiences that, that lead me to that. Uh, a very dear friend of mine, a gentleman by the name of Gordy Hawkins, uh, who presently lives out in uh, Newport Beach, California, was a, a very dear friend uh, to President Ford uh, during his years out in Palm Springs. And uh, they were able to play golf on a number of occasions. And I never got to know Gordy until probably about 2004 when I went out to 29 Palms, California to uh, command a uh, Marine base out there. And uh, I met Gordy through a variety of uh, circumstances, but uh, he kind of became one of my senior mentors as, uh, as we went along. Gordy will be 90 years old this December. And uh, he'd say, Rick, always remember that there's three things that are key to a good speech. You have a great beginning, you have a rousing finish, and you have very little in between. So I'm going, to, I'm going to try to keep that in mind. But uh, perhaps the greatest surprise about tonight is uh, I'm joined here uh, with some uh, you know, extended relatives. Uh, uh, my daughter, Elizabeth, was married to a, a young, handsome sergeant uh, of the Marine Corps, Michael Lesowitz, who hails from the great city of Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan. Uh, we are joined tonight by Mike and Judy Lesowitz, who are here, and a uh, great uncle and uh, Linda and uh, Jack Brown. So uh, thank you very much for being here. And uh, Mike and Judy, there was something, I can't remember, uh, I was supposed to give you a message. Uh, 
I, I, it had something to do with money, but I can't, uh, I can't, I can't exactly remember uh, what that was. But uh, thank you so much for being out here tonight. And Bruce, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, this is truly an honor. And Congressman Mailer, uh, the time spent tonight, we were able to share dinner and uh, to hear some of the perspectives of the congressman and where this journey began and where it's going uh, is all very, very important. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about CNA, first of all. Uh, CNA was an organization that used to be called the Center for Naval Analyses that began during the Second World War. And it became a think tank looking to improve our Navy's ability to fight uh, anti-submarine warfare. And at the conclusion of World War II, it remained as a think tank, a research and analysis group that worked primarily for the Department of the Navy. But as the years developed, uh, it also became a group that did analysis and policy analysis inside the Beltway. So CNA today is no longer the Center for Naval Analyses. They're just CNA, but they have sub-elements that are their Institute for Public Policy and the Center for Naval Analyses. But they do a variety of studies, and uh, in 2006, uh, they had an idea that uh, they wanted to try to capitalize on some of the experience of the recently retired military members. Uh, so they formed this uh, military advisory board. And in 2006, they embarked on a, a series of studies that were almost entirely energy related and the impact on our national security. Everything that I talk to you tonight will probably be shaped by my view looking through the prism of national security and my military uh, perspective. I'm not sure I'm going to tell you anything you don't already know, and I'm not going to tell you anything different, but I'll probably give you another perspective that as a person who has sat out there for the last 36 years, along with my colleagues, we've developed some very, very uh, strong opinions and ideas about national defense and energy independence. Uh, collectively, we have over 400 years of experience, and we always throw that out there because it just tells you we're really old people that are, that are part of this. But uh, that's what CNA does, and, and as Bruce mentioned, perhaps the most important exchange is what I hear uh, later on this evening, when I hear what your questions and comments were. My last 24 hours that uh, Katie Baker, who's sitting up here, is, I mean, she has been absolutely masterful to getting me to all the places that I needed to be. I mean, it's unbelievable. And, and Mark, she said she wanted a pay raise. She said, anybody that does this kind of work deserves more pay. Katie, I've said it for you. Uh, just kidding. But uh, in the last 24 hours, between radio interviews, uh, live chats online, uh, visits out in, uh, in uh, Grand Haven uh, this morning with, with leaders who are forging a way in terms of uh, renewable energy, there are so many things going up here in Michigan that, that you have a lot to be proud of. And uh, it's reassuring to me because I know the, the refrain that many of you hear is, okay, all this messaging that's going out about energy independence and renewable uh, energies and technologies, where, where does it end up? Who listens to these stories? And who is taking action to make sure that our grandson you know, 30 years from now isn't fighting somewhere in the Middle East or Southwest Asia, trying to ensure that he can help uh, satisfy this insatiable uh, demand for petroleum that our country still uh, demands. The CNA, we are not, we're not environmentalists, uh, we're not greenies, we're not alarmists, I hope. Uh, again, we, we are very conservative citizens who have served our nation and hope that we can inform the debate that really needs to happen uh, today, tonight, and in the future. And I really hope in my heart of hearts that when these debates start in the fall and our candidates are sitting up on the, the platforms, I hope they're going to get questions about energy. Uh, what is the roadmap for America to energy independence? Uh, my suspicion is unless the price of a gallon of gas is over $4 a gallon, it's going to fall to discussions about immigration, the trade deficit, the national debt. Uh, you take your pick. That's what's going to dominate the, uh, uh, the tone, if you will, of, of the elections coming up. But we really do need to sit down and start talking about where this nation is going in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, how did I get here? Uh, let me give you two quick perspectives. And, uh, there's a slide up here that, that should pop up. 
or maybe not. Do I have to do it up here? There's an arrow key. There's a lot of arrow keys here. <laughs> that one? There we go. Okay. This, this is kind of, and, and this is not really the map I wanted to show you. Uh, there, were, there are much more detailed maps that I looked at every day in 2006. Uh, but as you look at this map in Anbar province, uh, just note the number of camps or the forward operating bases or combat outposts that were scattered all over uh, Anbar province, which was roughly the size of North Carolina, depending upon square mileage and where you had to fly. Uh, in 2006, there was the bombing of the Golden Mosque in Iraq, and that absolutely turned the uh, war at that point on its ear. It probably drew us as close to a civil war uh, inside of Iraq, uh, as, as we saw during the, the year that I was there. Uh, if I could drill down to this area, I don't have a pointer here, so I apologize. If I could, if I could drill down to these two dots here between Arusha and Ramadi, uh, a distance of about 30 miles uh, on a map, uh, every day we would see that map blown up, and I would see red dots and they would be a listing of all the significant events that happened in the last 24 hours. And from about March of 2006 on, we saw a steady spike uh, in the attacks on coalition forces. Small arms fire, indirect fire, but especially the evolution of the IED attacks on our, on our vehicles, our soldiers, our sailors, our Marines. Uh, I got a call one day from the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and I had a a uh, computer on my desk and he could just beam right in and he wasn't my operational boss but he was my service boss all the way back at in Washington and he says Zomer what are you doing what are you doing about these IED attacks which tragically had not only the the effect of, of, of wounding and killing our, our service members but it also had a political element that played as many of you know back here and it became as much of a political uh, issue as it was just a tactical war fighting issue. And he said, you need to tell us what you need out there. You need to tell us because right now you have a number of people back in the States that are looking at a, a number of uh, capabilities they want to provide to you. One of them was to bring these old OV-10 pilots out of retirement, put them into King Air aircraft and put them up in the sky to uh, uh, achieve this thing that we called uh, persistent surveillance, meaning we were always looking down at these areas. But we had that 30-mile that, that strip between Fallujah and uh, Ramadi that was absolutely deadly to our forces. So in the analysis, uh, we talked about some equipment issues that were related to that, but we thought also from an exposure perspective, how could we reduce the exposure of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines being out in the roads all the time. Uh, now certainly tactical formations, uh, uh, patrolling, all those things had to happen. But as we looked at it, we said, you know, uh, the Army was looking at, they, they said basically about one in 24 convoys, resupply convoys, that they sent out resulted in a casualty to a soldier. Our experience in the Marine Corps was about 10% of our casualties were related to these convoys that were going out there. We said, well, look, we need to find a way to get away from this exposure. And oh, by the way, what are those convoys moving out there? What is it so critical that is out there to cover all these different bases out there? And no surprise, it was diesel fuel, it was batteries, it was water, but it was the energy, the energy that our forces needed to fight that war in Iraq. Uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, our service members who are out there, our warriors who are out there right now, are without a question the most capable, the best equipped uh, warriors on the face of the planet ever. These guys and gals are so capable that are out there. But in World War II, it took basically about one gallon of gasoline per soldier per day to, 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 to fuel the operations of our forces in Europe. Today, it takes about 22 gallons per soldier per day to fuel the operations of our forces in Afghanistan. 
So all that technology, all that capability has come at a price. We are more dependent, our forces are more dependent on petroleum and its distillates today than at any time. And so in order to, to support those, those operations, we had to constantly put these convoys out in these, in these threat areas. Uh, it wasn't matter, uh, just a, it wasn't just a case of sending out a convoy to go to these distant places out west and, and, uh, and up north. Uh, before we ever sent those, those convoys out, we usually sent out uh, an air reconnaissance that was usually a jet of some sort was out there flying over the route using some of their, their capabilities aboard the aircraft to look at these routes. Uh, we always preceded our convoys with route clearance convoys that went out uh, that had the ability to identify, spot a number of these uh, IEDs were out there to reduce those. We had a security element that was integral to the convoy itself, the convoy out. The convoy went out. There was always helicopter support uh, on station if our convoys needed it. There was always a quick reaction force on standby that if the convoy did get hit or anybody else got hit outside the wire, they were on station to go there. Uh, we had CASEVAC, casualty evacuation capability, always standing by to go out there. So these convoys were absolutely uh, tying down our freedom of maneuver uh, in, that, in that zone, in that, in that battle zone in Anbar. So uh, again, it was very consuming to be able to provide this diesel fuel, the batteries, all the things that operated the air conditioning for the combat operation centers, the, the computers, the printers, uh, the television monitors for our surveillance, uh, ice uh, in, in, in the reefers to keep uh, food cool when we had places where we could put those things. So uh, that is the nature of the war we were fighting uh, in Iraq. As a result of that, some of my smart guys, I had, uh, I had a two-man technology division. One was a colonel who had a degree in artificial intelligence and he was a motor transport officer, so I never connected the two on that. But uh, we sat down and we said, okay, what are some of the things that we could potentially do to uh, reduce this threat? And uh, we talked many times. My experience at 29 Palms, California, is uh, we had at the time the fourth largest uh, uh, photovoltaic solar field uh, in the Department of Defense. We've been out there for years at 29 Palms, California. We also had a code generator uh, that we used to uh, generate electricity. That between those two items, we could generate just about 58% of our required energy on base. And since that time, 29 Palms has been recognized a number of times for its, its efficiency and the, the, the efforts that were undertaken to, to reduce this footprint uh, of energy. Uh, if uh, those of you who have been down in Palm Springs and driven along Interstate 10 from Los Angeles to uh, going east, you get into Coachella Valley and you see these huge wind farms that are down there. Now granted, uh, the, the atmospheric conditions, the geography down there lends itself to that, but you have these huge wind farms. And what we wanted to do was try to use this, uh, what we called a joint, a joint universal needs statement. It comes from the warfighter saying, I need the following things in order to, to fight a more effective battle. We penned, authored this, this June's, we sent it back, it got back into DC, uh, stating off-the-shelf technologies would really help us if we, could, you know, if, we could, if we could provide the energy through renewable sources and we wouldn't have to put as many convoys out there with as much fuel and, and, and on and on and on. Uh, the, the universal needs statement, to the best of my knowledge, never it, never it never resulted in anything other than in 2009, uh, the Secretary of Defense decided to stand up uh, a, new, a new position in, this, in the Department of Defense, the Assistant Secretary of Defense, for operational energy. And I had the great honor of listening to Secretary Burke uh, speak about a month ago. And I'm proud as a retired Marine to see the great work that the Department of Defense is doing to try to embrace uh, this, this necessity, demand, if you will, for us as a nation to begin reducing our energy footprint and the need that we have. Uh, in our study, we looked, again, this is the, the fourth attempt at looking at energy. And the, this maintaining freedom of movement in the transportation sector and looking at uh, alternative sources was what our study was about. 
it really kind of glued, if you will, together or, or connected the dots of the first three studies that looked at climate change and the, the military implications on climate change. And, you know, and I'm not here to convince you that we have climate change or global warming. That's not my, my uh, intent tonight. But certainly, uh, many of the nations on this globe besides ours do believe it. And we've seen the droughts that are happening. We've seen the rise in sea levels. And as military planners who are looking out, where are the interests of America in the future? Where are we going to be employed in the future? Certainly indicate that, that we are going to have to be able to respond to that. We talked also in our second and third studies about powering our economy and powering our defense. And then the fourth part, uh, the study we just completed last year, last uh, October we unveiled the study, was that if we don't address the energy demands of this nation, it constitutes a significant national security threat to this nation. In 1973, when I was sitting out there in, uh, in Kutztown, and uh, many of you remember, I'm sure, the, uh, the, the embargo uh, and uh, uh, what it meant of having to st stand in lines uh, to wait for fuel, that you had to buy your fuel uh, either by uh, uh, the last digit on your license tag and you couldn't buy more than eight gallons. And I was sitting on a motorcycle back then and I was thinking I was pretty something special because I could fill up my motorcycle when cars couldn't, uh, couldn't fill up the tanks because it had been rationed at that point. That was in 1973, and as I do recall, President Nixon, uh, he didn't sign legislation, but he said we need to get energy independence. And this is four years after the greatest nation on the planet put a man on the moon, and four years later, we're being held hostage by OPEC uh, through an oil embargo. And I think we all saw uh, that we have limitations, we have vulnerabilities. In 1973, we imported roughly uh, 30 percent of the oil that we consume as a nation. That was in 1973. And here we sit in 2012, we import somewhere in the order between 45 and 50 percent of the oil that we consume as a nation. So uh, one of the assumptions of our study was business as usual is not working. Business as usual is not working. Uh, there is a fundamental change that has to happen. There is a looming crisis out there. When we look at the economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, these are the fastest growing economies in the world. China's demand for uh, oil is growing at about 7.5% a year. Somewhere in the next 10 to 15 years, we see this is going to be uh, a cataclysmic uh, event. When we are now competing, with the world economies, the global economies for petroleum, uh, we're going to be competing for price and we're going to be competing for supply. Uh, we think that it's time that we need to be able to start taking firm steps to, to offset uh, that event that is certainly coming. Uh, there are a number of key choke points around the earth. Uh, the Strait of Hormuz is probably most uh, uh, most on everybody's lips, about 20% of all the petroleum that fuels the global economies of this world comes through the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, we've all sat through it, uh, the saber rattling that occurs whenever Iran uh, perceives a threat to its uh, authority, its autonomy, to close down the Strait of Hormuz. In the very middle of the Strait of Hormuz, you can see, you can see Iran and you can see uh, the opposite shore in the, the Gulf Cooperation Council regions. You can see both sides. Uh, if we were to close that down, if we were to close the Strait of Hormuz down, our estimate is in 30 days, in 30 days you would bring the global economy to its knees. You would certainly bring the economy of the United States to its knees. Uh, the damage that it would do to our trucking industry, somewhere in the order of about 37,000 jobs would be caused by that. We estimate the, the damage to gross domestic product would be somewhere in the order of about $75 billion. Uh, it would be devastating. And there are other choke points. If you look at the Suez, the Panama Canal, Bond el Bab, uh, the Moroccan Straits, they are all around this globe and they are the transit points for this petroleum that we require as a nation to fuel our, our, uh, our military. Uh, 
Uh, something I commend to your reading at some time in the future. In 1957, Admiral Rickover, uh, the father of the uh, nuclear navy, delivered a speech up in Minnesota to an association of doctors. Uh, it is one of the most timeless speeches that you could almost change the date from 1957 to 2012. But he talks about fossil fuels and petroleum. They are a finite resource. It took millions and millions of years to create the petroleum that we have today. We are using it at a rate that it's never been uh, used before. And whether you believe that it's going to run out in 50 years or 100 years, most would tell you, most special subject matter experts would tell you that that oil is going to be gone one day. It's going to be gone. And if we continue to rely on petroleum to fuel this economy that we have, uh, we're going to be in deep trouble. Our study also revealed that there were things that we could do about it. Uh, two, two key components. One, that we could reduce our own demand through further efficiencies. There is a lot of things, and we felt that if we could reduce by 30%, as a nation, we would develop that shock absorber that we require to uh, navigate, uh, navigate any of these spikes that we would see as a result of threats uh, or actual attempts to close any of these uh, key choke points around the globe. Uh, the new CAFE standards that have been established for 2025 to advance the average uh, car's mileage to 54.5 miles to a gallon of gas is a heroic step forward. Uh, the automakers all deserve our great support for that. I'm sure we'll pay a little bit more for our cars in 2025, but that has the equivalent of savings about two and a half million barrels a day, which is about half of what we import from OPEC right now. Uh, there are great steps in efficiencies that are still yet to be done. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to use this example, but I will here and you'll probably throw me out. Uh, I, I found a point about two months ago where I didn't have a car. Uh, my wife was down visiting and, uh, with a grandson and she had her car. My son was going back and forth to school. He had my other car. And my truck was in the, uh, the shop for repair. So I had to go out and get a car. So uh, I decided that it was about behavior change and I was going to be driven by miles per gallon of gas. And uh, so I went down to, don't throw me out, the Volkswagen dealership. <clears throat> And uh, I ended up buying a, a turbo diesel. Uh, it's a four-cylinder engine, advertised at about 42 miles to a gallon of gas. Uh, if I drive at 55, at 55 with my windows up on a flat highway, I can push almost 50 miles to a gallon of gas in that thing. But it's black, it's got a neat interior, it's got a kick and sound system. So it's, it's, not, it's not all, uh, you know, just being uh, uh, fiscal. It, it, it jumps out. That turbo diesel, is, it's got a lot of jump. But those are the sort of things you know, that we've got to be able to do. We, we need to change behavior in this nation about the way we view energy. You know, those of you who have traveled abroad, uh, you get to uh, Manila, you get to Singapore, uh, Jakarta. Uh, the first thing you're going to notice is these societies are driving scooters that all get 80 to 100 miles to a gallon of gas uh, because of the high price of energy. And I'm not suggesting that we all need to go on motorcycles and things like that. But there needs to, the way we have our infrastructure study, uh, built right now, changes to our highways, changes to the off-ramps, the on-ramps, uh, there are many things that the engineers can still do to help us save that energy. So there, we have a lot of efficiencies that can still be realized, but we need to get behind it. We need to be supportive of it. The other element of that is we sit on a threshold right now of some extraordinary alternative fuel sources that are out there. You know, whether it's natural gas, whether it's uh, hybrid vehicles, whether it's the biofuels, wh whether it's the development of algae, there are a lot of near-term, and when I say near-term, in many cases we're talking five to ten years, and there are some consequences about using some of these alternative technologies, but they're out there. They're out there and they need our support. The support is not going to happen without a national roadmap that takes us there. Uh, and this is certainly not a criticism of any of our administration, but we've been at this since 1973. You know, we get concerned when the price of a gallon of gas goes up to four dollars a gallon. But we need a policy, we need a roadmap that is going to take this nation. That has to happen first. First thing has to happen. We need to have recognition that we have a crisis that's out there. 
and we're not going to wait until the 11th hour to solve it. And that's one solution. Some people say, well, the market forces will correct it when that day of uh, recognition or reckoning comes, so we'll fix it then. And uh, you know, my military experience in planning tells me that's probably not a good plan. You know, you see a problem out there. It's time now that we need to start thinking how we get through that. And that's why we the first part is we need a policy that is binding on future administrations. Much like we tried to put a man on the moon by the end of this decade, every administration that came in adopted that. It was something that was passed along. And every president, every administration felt some obligation to make sure they did their part, their share, to make sure we put a man on the moon at the end of the decade. It, it needs to have that sort of support. It needs to have that sort of buy-in. But there is a big role for the government to play. And, and that's what I hope uh, comes from this debate and dialogue. Uh, what can, you know, I get the question, what can we do about it? And I think what we can do about it is what you're doing tonight by being here. And, and, and this is the way the word gets passed, this is the way the gospel gets out there, that there is a national security issue that's going to affect our livelihood, our way of life in the next 10 to 15 years if we don't address it now. So um, again, not all bad news, there's a lot of things that, that, that can happen here and we see, and again, coming to Michigan here, I mean just hearing some of the briefs I got today from people about that are you know, certainly where they want to go with some of these alternative forms. Uh, sensing there about the importance of renewable energy is, is very is very heartwarming, and and that's why we go to Q and A here in a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to go back and we're going to reconvene the military advisory board and kind of talk about our experiences out on the road, you know, pitching this and 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 how it was received, but also understanding what your concerns are uh, about what we need to do as a nation. So uh, again, we see this uh, consumption of oil as a uh, this is a uh, a threat to our national security. Uh, the economic impact of this, uh, we spend about a billion dollars a day goes out to import oil. You know, our, our trade deficit in 2010 was something in order of about $462 billion. So you just take half of that. What about the reinvestment, the opportunity cost that we don't realize because this money is going to places and it's going to customers that in many cases do not have uh, good things uh, to do with the United States. They are potential enemies out there. Some are enemies out there. And in many cases, we're lining some very seedy customers with uh, American dollars. Uh, last thing I'll leave you with is, you know, somebody asked me this morning, what was that moment that, that made the impression on you? <clears throat> and on the second day of the ground war in uh, Desert Storm, uh, I, I walked out after we, we, we buttoned up the night before we were in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, at midnight, we crossed the border into Kuwait. And it was an amazing sight because uh, in the early days of those technologies, we, we had just begun to use night vision goggles in a large way. And all of our vehicles, for the purposes of identification, were marked with infrared lights of one sort or another. So in pitch black, to the naked eye, you'd be looking out there, you could hear engines running, but you couldn't see a thing. And when you pulled down your NVGs and looked out there, it looked like Broadway. I mean, there were lights everywhere. I mean, it was thousands of vehicles all ready to go. We crossed into, into Kuwait, and uh, for the next, uh, really about the next 12, 14 hours, I was, I was part of a regimental command team, I was the operations for Task Force Ripper, and we were inside our command tractor, which is an armored vehicle, uh, Marine Corps uses it for ship to shore movement, but uh, we adapt everything for the needs of the time, and we were fighting desert warfare with these things. But it really wasn't until about, somewhere about 12 o'clock the next day before we stopped to take a halt, we lowered the ramp, and everybody walked out. And, you know, we'd been fighting uh, all night and going through the Iraqi uh, defenses and uh, breaching two minefields in the process. The artillery strikes that were supposed to happen never happened, thankfully, because of our great air forces who were up there reducing these threats. But when we walked out, the last sun, the last sunlight that I saw, the last daylight I saw the day before was in Kuwait. And it was, you know, typical, it was, you know, a little bit of haze, but you could see blue sky, you could see the sun, it was hot. We walked out, it was like walking out into evening twilight. It was black, the sky was black, 
Uh, it was eerily cool when we walked out. And we looked up, and there was this white plate in the sky, and it wasn't bright. I mean, you could look directly at it, and that was the sun. And, uh, of course, what had happened at that point, the Iraqi forces had torched all the uh, wellheads in uh, Kuwait to create the environmental disaster that, that, that followed. And, you know, I, I thought to myself, and I was looking almost for the cannon camera, you know, for the, you know, the catchy expression. You know, I was like, what are we doing here? Does anybody know that we're here? I mean, it was eerie, it was surreal, but it was certainly related, you know. Saddam went into Kuwait to take the, uh, the oil fields in Kuwait. And, uh, you know, World War II started over an oil embargo to the Japanese government. So we are going to be contested for energy in the future. And again, I, we think from a military perspective, a national security perspective, it's not too soon to start. And uh, if uh, last thing let me leave you with here is uh, you can go to CNA the website. And uh, this is a copy uh, of our last study, but all four, all four of the studies are up there online. And uh, please feel free to, to take a look at those. And uh, let, me, let me close by thanking you again for your interest uh, in energy, uh, renewable energies, national security, and uh, where we're going as a nation. We need, we need more people like you out there, and we need to get the word out. And our, our elected officials need to hear about it. It needs to be important to them. It won't be important to them until we make it important to them. So uh, with that, thank you very much, and uh, we'll do some Q&A. I was at ARPA E this uh, this last March, and um, there was a naval officer there talking about the Navy's pledge to switch to biofuels. And I know I was reading in the trade press that the Air Force, I thought, had set a goal of 50% biofuels for their, at least for the domestic flights. Can, can you comment on, on those two efforts and and uh, where they're getting their biofuels from. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, as I said in my remarks, I, I've been very impressed with what the Department of Defense is doing. All the services are taking this on in a big way. The Air Force has established uh, goals to get much of their uh, domestic fleet flying over the nation uh, working on biofuels. And I forget what the timeline is. The Navy wants to have a green fleet by 2016 to go out all those ships operating uh, off of the biofuels. The USS Macon is the first hybrid ship that's out there that works off of electricity and diesel. Uh, they have a goal also to reduce the, uh, the energy, energy footprint going to, I think, 20% of renewables. Uh, and I have to go back and check the date. The Marine Corps is working on its experimental Ford operating base using solar blankets to uh, get the energy to recharge uh, batteries, to uh, run lighting, run computers, uh, looking at new materials for shelters that, uh, that will keep uh, the, uh, the equipment and our Marines cool without having to use AC units. We're looking at more efficient uh, generators uh, to, we'll still need generators. Uh, so I think each of the services is looking at establishing and uh, reducing the footprint trying to transition to renewable energies, and they all have very, very uh, legitimate goals, I think, now by, by 2020 to uh, arrive at that. So uh, I think it's good news there uh, in, in the direction we're going right now. Uh, but here's, here's one of my fears hanging out there, is we have sequestration. It's gonna happen in January. And uh, if sequestration comes to pass, the cuts that are gonna be happening across the government to reduce the uh, the spending deficit, it's going to hit the Department of Defense in a very, very big way. Uh, and it could be up to 20%. If that happens, and right now, uh, January is only you know, less than six months away, uh, when it comes time to decide what racks and stacks, what do you keep and what do you get rid of, what goes off the side, it's going to be things, I'm afraid, like energy initiatives, programs, those are going to be at the very, very top of the list of things that are going to get cut. So potentially all this progress that we had begun to make since 2009, I think, is very much at risk with sequestration. So uh, the Department of Defense has a large role to play in this. Uh, we talk about the development of internet, computers, uh, GPS, 
jet propulsion. Uh, Department of Defense has been a pioneer for a lot of new technologies, and, and we believe the Department of Defense still plays a major role in that process. And we don't want to be green. Uh, we don't want to be uh, energy, uh, clean energy, clean technology for the sake of being green or being technologically advanced. In the military, what it's about is being lighter, faster, and more lethal in the battlefield. That's what we're after. We have seen our forces become so heavy in the last 10 years. Like I said, our requirements for fuel, the, 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 the nature of the war that we've fought in Iraq and are fighting now in Afghanistan, and how we've had to heavy up our forces, the requirement to move our forces in armor-protected vehicles, troop carriers, you know, we never experienced that before. We saw the destructive uh, uh, capacity of these IEDs that would destroy main battle tanks, not just thin-skinned vehicles. So uh, the nature of war has evolved in the last 10 years. Uh, and we've become very, very heavy, and we've become very, very energy dependent. And we need to find ways to be able to reduce that signature. Um, how, has the, how have government leaders responded to your report, and, and you know, how has the media responded? How about the general public? And, and I wasn't aware of it until I started doing the research on, on your visit. So, what's been the reception? The the reception we've got since last October, and again, that's my first rollout of of a study. Uh, some of the other, and I understand uh, some of my uh, uh, colleagues have been up here before. Vice Admiral Gunn was up, and General Keyes. We're up here in Michigan a couple months back. But I'd say when we were over on Capitol Hill last October, uh, we briefed the, uh, the staffers from the Senate and uh, uh, we had Senator Warner, former senator from Virginia, was there in a big way. In fact, he penned the acknowledgement up front in our study. Uh, Congressman Roscoe uh, Bartlett, who has been a, a, a long champion of energy efficiency, was there. Uh, we have been, I've been to Florida. I've been to the Admiral Moore Energy Forum. I testified before the Environmental Protective Agency in Philadelphia in March. Uh, I've been to a number, a number of, given this, uh, these comments a couple of times. And again, the problem is I, I'm probably largely talking to believers. And the people that are here already understand the gravity of the, of the situation. Uh, so we haven't yet uh, been criticized. Uh, we've been praised on Capitol Hill. Uh, we also sent a letter to the Secretary of Defense uh, that was signed by Sherry Goodman, uh, our executive leader for the, uh, for the MAB. Uh, and everything we hear back is all very, very positive. Oddly enough, oddly enough, some of the language that we use in our study uh, looked vaguely familiar in the White House roadmap that came out last, uh, last year. And uh, we began to wonder if it was just coincidence or if we were able to reach out and, and, and affect uh, the White House, and, and I'm sure I'm, I'm sure it's, it's probably just coincidence, but uh, the roadmap that came out of the White House is a start last year. But we really need to put a lot of meat on that bone to to make it binding, to make it to, to give it the sort of uh, uh, comprehensive uh, approach to energy that it needs to have. And again, it's not just the White House; it's not the administration; it's all the national leadership that has to get behind us. Uh, this question always comes up, and it's a favorite one of mine. Uh, would a carbon tax be the most effective or an effective means to force a shift to alternative sources of energy? Um, <laughs> we try to remain apolitical at, at CNA. And, and, we, and again, our credibility, we think, is, is hinges upon that. But what we've said is what has to happen is, uh, I think, the government's role in alternative energies, we need to create the incentives, the prizes, to make sure that there is, there is a reason that, that business won't get into this game. And until we create those prizes, those incentives to draw industry in there, and it is going to take some help. Uh, and I know everybody's thinking Solyndra, and you know, th th these are bad examples. But in some cases, the government does need to get behind these programs. And in some cases, it's probably going to be funding support. Now, we probably need to go back and look at the process of how we select those companies. And we certainly at CNA are not picking winners and losers. We, that's not in our, 
uh, a remit at all to do that. But uh, that is what I think is probably, in, in, order, in order to transition to those alternative sources, we need to create the incentive. And I'm not sure the incentive is there yet to do that, as opposed to a tax, uh, a penalty, if you will, uh, to, to achieve that. Uh, any thoughts on how the Middle East would change politically if we radically reduced oil dependence? And when I say we, uh, I'm thinking maybe uh, the, the questioner's thinking a worldwide effort to reduce oil dependence. Certainly if we reduced ours, but the Chinese and the Indians and the Brazilians just came in and, and, and took it, I don't think there'd be a change. But what do you think would happen in the Middle East? It's a great question, Bruce, and we got that question earlier in the day, you know, what would be the impact? And I would say this, that if we, you know, turned off, reduced our, our, our demand for petroleum, it would have an impact in the Middle East somewhere. Uh, I mean, even if you look at an example of, of Iraq invading Kuwait, uh, there will still be, and, and there's still going to be a need for petroleum here in the next, you know, in the next 30, 40 years. We had some representatives come in from the, the auto industry, and the internal combustion engine is going to be around for a long time. Uh, it's not going to go away. But we, again, through efficiencies and reducing the demand and looking at alternative sources, you know, we, uh, there's a balance out there. And there's no silver bullets. We haven't found one form of alternative energy that's going to replace gasoline. It'll never happen. Gasoline is what it is because of its, uh, its uh, tremendous uh, efficiency as, a, uh, as an energy producer. But, uh, Rather than a silver bullet, you know, we've talked about silver buckshot. And this is probably one of the, the changes to how we think about energy is that people are going to need to look at this diverse portfolio of, of alternative uh, sources out there. You know, is my car driven by electricity? Is it driven by natural gas? Is it li driven by diesel? Is it driven by gasoline, uh, by biofuels, by ethanol, by methane? I mean, that's, that's the landscape. Unless we find something, and it doesn't appear on the horizon that there's any single uh, source of energy that's out there, it's a diverse portfolio, and that's what we need to be able to transition to. I, I think I heard you were at L3 Communications today. Uh, I'm curious, did they talk about their green taxi project? Can you describe it for this group um, in, in a few, I mean, I've heard it and I'll help you, but uh, I think it's an example of you know, one little slice of the energy usage pie being addressed. And, and I think what you're saying is, you know, we need a hundred, we need a thousand of these small efforts to build, to build up. So I find this one intriguing. And I'm going to probably give it right back to Bruce because I think he probably knows more about it than I do. But we were out at L3, triple three today. And I mean, first of all, what that uh, corporation does for the security of this nation is, is unbelievable. I mean, it is, if you've never been through that, that, that facility, uh, their ability to produce, I mean, when you talk about heavy industry in the United States, and, and the remarkable thing is they've got machinery in there that uh, was put in there in the 1940s. When that plant was built to build power packs for tanks in the 1940s, some of that equipment is still there, still working. And, uh, I don't know that our nation has that industrial capacity anymore to do stuff. It does, but it's not, it's not like it was, obviously, 60, 70 years ago. But one of the initiatives they're looking at is this green taxi is an energy-driven uh, wheel assembly that would allow the aircraft to uh, taxi without the benefit of firing its main engines and burning you know, fuel at thousands of pounds per minute. Uh, and it won't require the uh, uh, the oh what's the uh, the, the little the, the cars to push the uh, the trolleys to push the uh, the tugs thank you the tugs taxes to move the aircraft back and forth and the savings just just the savings on that alone you know the five percent of taxing you know back and forth is a huge waste of fuel and this is something that again it's a very a very clean technology that they're they're working with very impressive and it's just you know, a simple idea, but uh, it has tremendous results. And it's not ready for prime time yet. They're not there yet. But it's, it's, it's the type of things industry needs to think about, and it's the type of things that need to be rewarded uh, for, for doing that sort of research. 
for those of you interested, I think there's a YouTube, YouTube video. Uh, if you look for green tax, I think Lufthansa uh, demonstrated that you could do circle uh, figure eights with a uh, with a jet plane if you wanted to, and on the apron way of a of an airport. Um, is there not enough natural gas to make us energy independent? Um, I know you haven't held yourself out in terms of quantifying, so just comment on natural gas and what role it can play in the interim or in the long term or in the short term. Yeah, natural gas is a, is a big player, uh, but it's still part of a larger portfolio that uh, we don't see uh, all of our requirement and demand shifting to, to, to natural gas. And, and there, are, there are clearly some problems here. And in many of our states, uh, it's we're not drilling here. Uh, not in this neighborhood, we're not gonna go after it. So it's not necessarily the guaranteed source that we want it to be. But natural gas would be a huge step. And as Admiral Rickover said, is, as a nation, we need to look at our reserves, whether it's natural gas or petroleum, we need to look at that as money in the bank. And you have that money for a period of time to make sure that uh, your future generations are going to be able to live. So I think the natural gas gives us a little bit more breathing space, if you will. It represents one of those alternative energies. Uh, it's, it's, it's a cleaner burn than, than gasoline in terms of greenhouse gases. Uh, it's, it's largely domestic, as are most of these alternative fuel sources that are out there. They are largely domestic. We can almost bring these things together almost entirely from a domestic standpoint and reduce that reliance. So the natural gas is a huge piece, it's a, it's a step forward, but I don't believe, as I, you know, my colleagues, that it is an answer in and of itself. It's not that silver bullet. Kind of in the same vein, um, gasification of biomass produces the same type of gas. Does the military have programs for using biomass um, either in the field or uh, here in the U.S.? Uh, absolutely. The biomass is, is where we thought the Navy wanted to go here in the last, uh, last couple of years in trying to develop those sources internally. And we think that the market here, uh, even in our domestic basis stateside, is, is a great place where we can do the biofuels, the bio, the, the bio gases. They have a large uh, part to play. But as I said earlier, we would never sacrifice performance uh, in combat. Uh, if we can't find the drop-in fuels that are have the same efficiency and effectiveness as we currently do, uh, we're not going to put airplanes up in the sky that uh, are not as effective as they need to be. So uh, until these, these alternative fuels demonstrate that they can still uh, not inhibit performance of our systems, uh, we're going to be uh, using them. But again, in our domestic bases, our garrisons here, there's a lot more that we can do to reduce that. Currently, Department of Defense is about 2%. We're the biggest customer in the United States for petroleum. It represents about 2%. But again, that's a big 2% that we want to find a way to reduce. Um, China is moving on island groups in the South China Sea. The U.S. has denounced this. Is this an energy resource grab by China, and is, is it in the USA's interest to challenge it on the basis of energy? Thank you. Uh, we're talking about the Spratly Islands uh, right now that are in the South China Sea. Uh, a number of countries have claimed uh, uh, ownership. China, the Philippines, um, uh, there's a couple other different nations of all, Vietnam, have all laid claim to the Spratly Islands. Uh, there have been uh, uh, gun battles uh, in the Spratly Islands, and these little islands that are out in the middle of nowhere are largely believed to be the, uh, the home of, of lots of uh, petroleum reserves. And uh, uh, this is the sort of competition I think that we are you know, worried about in the future as we contest these ever dwindling sources of of, of uh, fossil fuels and petroleum that are out there. So the Spratly Islands uh, are of a concern. Uh, this, earlier this year, President Obama announced a shift, a focus, if you will, for the United States of America to begin to look back to the Asian Pacific. Uh, clearly, the markets of tomorrow are there. That's where the biggest markets for the United States are. Uh, 
uh, we want to be able to begin shifting ourselves to pivot, if you will, to the Pacific. But this is the, the, the challenge that that's where the money is, that's where the, the, the future uh, economic security of the United States lies in, in, in Asia, East Asia, and the Western Pacific, but we still get tethered back to the Middle East. We still have that, you know, that need to get that, you know, that 45 to 50 percent of imported oil, much of it coming, not all of it coming from uh, uh, the Middle East, but a lot of it. And it's, you know, we want to be able to look forward, we want to be able to look west, if you will, but we continue to get tugged back to the uh, back east to the, uh, the Middle East. Just as you were talking, I was thinking about Japan, and, and uh, I can say I, I went through school not realizing that, that uh, the Japanese were responding to having been cut off by shell uh, from oils in, the, in Indonesia, and that's what prompted them in part to attack the U.S. Um, but what about Japan currently? You know, here's a, here's a nation that doesn't have any reserves, and now they're nuclear. Um, capacity is being questioned. You know, can, can you talk a little bit about what can a country like Japan do and, and what have they done? Are they a, a good example or a bad example for us? Uh, I think, first of all, if, if you look at Japan like any nation, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it can't be limited to just as, it's, uh, an energy relationship that we have with Japan right now. Japan is one of our strongest allies and have been for the last 60 plus years. The alliance is probably stronger today than it has been in any time probably in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, watching the events that are happening uh, in North Korea and China right now I think are of concern to the Japanese, but they are a very, very good partner for the alliance right now. We have a number of activities with basing. Uh, some of it not, you know, there's some issues, particularly with Marines in Okinawa, Japan. But uh, Japan hosts a large, a large capacity of the United States military uh, on its uh, homeland and off its, uh, off its waters. So uh, I think you know, Japan certainly, uh, uh, in response to the, uh, the earthquakes and, and the destruction of the, uh, uh, the nuclear facilities, I mean, they have a renewed uh, conscience, if you will, about nuclear energy and, and where they're going to be in the future with that. Uh, and they are dependent. And, and that's why even, you know, if we're able to reduce our dependence by about 30% in the next 10 years or so, uh, but if you interrupted that flow, it's not just the damage to the United States. It's a global economy, and we are part of a global economy. Uh, that's the fear, I think, is what it does to all these other nations who don't have additional resources that they can go to. But I think Japan... And we're not, you know, many nations up until last year, I think China was leading the way in renewable energy investment. They're putting about a billion dollars a week into uh, clean energies. Uh, the Chinese, they recognize it. And they want to be the leader in uh, clean technology and, and energies in the future. And uh, we, again, it's a competitive market, and I don't want to be able to have to buy energy from China 15, 20 years from now. And I don't think other nations are going to want to do that either. So. I think a lot of nations, and if you look at some of the examples we're talking about today in Denmark, uh, Denmark, I think, has a national goal to be renewable entirely uh, in the next, I want to say within the next 20 to 30 years, the entire nation of Denmark to be based on renewable energies. Now, you, Denmark can get away with this a little bit smaller, it's a different scale, but uh, you know, we're not the only ones out there that are trying to get out in this, in, in this market, and this represents a lot of potential for this country. I mean, and we can do this stuff domestically. We have the uh, technology, we have the industrial base to do these things. Uh, and it is, it, there's a lot of money to be invested in. If we weren't putting that a billion dollars a day out there, but we're in turn reinvesting in the United States, I think it'd be a great thing for our economy. Go ahead, Bruce, you want to first? Well, you know, I was, I was gonna ask that question because normally a crowd like this doesn't get there. You know, everybody comes with the idea that they're going to talk about renewables and, and um, but I think it's a fair question and certainly the military has developed some, some pretty good technologies uh, in the submarines and the aircraft carriers and, you know, there are module, modular nuclear plants that some companies are ready to sell. So, fair question. Uh, from from the uh, study perspective, uh, 
we believe that nuclear technology, nuclear power is still a part of that larger portfolio. But the same concerns everybody has, it's got to be done to a standard of safety that is uh, absolute. You, we can't, uh, there, you can't have failures uh, in nuclear energy. So uh, it's an important part of it. Uh, but again, uh, in and of itself, it's not going to be the sole, sole piece. Uh, but we didn't eliminate that as one of the uh, energy sources that we're going to need in the future. I'm going to wrap up with two more questions. One, uh, I, I got a press release today that says the Interior and Defense Departments are joining forces to promote renewable energy on federal lands. And then the audience, uh, uh, someone has posed the question, what about buildings and the energy they use on military bases? Uh, what's being done to, to make those facilities, if you pardon the expression, more carbon neutral or carbon neutral? Uh, the, the building process that we have right now, and I can just go back to the experience uh, when I was out at 29 Palms, we constructed a number of uh, 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 bachelor enlisted quarters there. The, the energy standards that we are, we are building to uh, DOD standards uh, and larger uh, EPA standards for efficiency in, in the buildings we put up. So uh, they are very, very uh, clean, if you will. They are very energy efficient. And again, there's a, you can translate that, like we said in Washington, there's no question that can't be asked that doesn't have a dollars and cents answer. Uh, and so we've made some very, very uh, important strides in, in building uh, uh, environmentally friendly buildings uh, that are efficient. Uh, so uh, the, the message is out there for the Department of Defense. And we probably meet a higher standard, I think, probably most, uh, most agencies in the government in doing that construction. So uh, we're doing well on that. And I know of an uh, uh, operation over in Grand, uh, in Holland, Michigan, making solar street lights for a lot of bases down in the southern portion of the U.S. He's got a very nice business supplying uh, those bases. Let me, let me give you a, a question here that will allow you to kind of wrap this. Um, was the focus of your group to look at national security first, or were you looking at energy first? W what was the starting point for your study, um, or, or was it both? I think if you talk about national security, National security uh, is an umbrella term, but it is made up of uh, military security, economic security, diplomatic security, and environmental security. Those four sub-elements all contribute to our national security. Uh, we all walked in there with, you know, we're not, there's, there, we are never going to sacrifice or compromise uh, our military and its ability to defend this nation. Uh, if it means that we take, you know, that 2% that we use right now and we never transition a drop to anything else and we continue to use JP8, JP5, diesel and gasoline, if that's what it takes to defend this nation, that's what we'll use. Uh, and we have that. Uh, but it's where we're going to be committed in the future. It's where our nation chooses to be engaged in the world. And it's like I ran through this rundown earlier, you know, starting with, uh, in 1980, you know, we stood up the Rapid Deployment Joint Task Force in response to the oil embargo, uh, in response to the hostage taking in Iran in 1980. In 1982, I spent about 45 days in Beirut, Lebanon, tied to issues uh, related to regional security, regional stability in the Middle East. You had the tanker wars in 1984 to 1988, which were a direct result of the war between Iran and Iraq. And the fight, uh, the tanker wars, uh, we had uh, U.S. Navy ships in the Persian Gulf for four years protecting the oil platforms, protecting ships transiting into and out of the Strait of Hormuz. We had the USS Vincennes tragically attacked by an Iraqi airplane that mistook uh, the identity of the Vincennes before it dropped a missile uh, that killed many of our sailors aboard the ship. In 1986, we were in Libya in Operation El Dorado Canyon, attacking uh, Gaddafi's forces as a result of the bombing uh, of the discotheques in, in Germany. Uh, 
Desert Shield, Desert Storm in 1991, Operation Northern Watch, Operation Southern Watch from 1991 into 2003, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's where our military has been for the last 25 years. That's Now, there are other national vital interests that need to take us there. There are others. The, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is something we need to be concerned about. We have alliances with key allies in the Middle East that we are, we are uh, committed to defending. Uh, we have the rise of radical uh, anti-Western uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism that is a threat uh, in many of our places and certainly we need to only look at 9-11 to know that. So there's a variety of interests, but uh, again, one asks himself, if it wasn't petroleum, if it wasn't safeguarding uh, what was coming through those uh, straits, uh, would we be as committed as we are over there? And I, I think the answer to that is evident. General, thank you very, very much.